afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thrilled to welcome you to yet another installation of Keeping It Brief and the first in 2022. This is a service of the Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition. I'm your host, Maria Evans. And our guest today is Jen King, who is Executive Director of the Council of Southeast PA and PROACT, Pennsylvania Recovery Organization Achieving Community Together. This midweek midday gathering on Zoom will be your monthly opportunity to get a quick update on an important issue from one of our partners or issue specialists. And they've been following it so, so that we can come in at this point when we can take some action to do something to advance the cause. I want to begin with a quick note about our technology. When you join the event, your microphone was muted, your camera turned off automatically. While you can see and hear us, nobody can see and hear you. So relax, grab your lunch, snack, coffee, enjoy today's conversation. If you have a question or comment, please type it into the chat box. I'll be monitoring that. You can find the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Click on it, it'll open up and just type in. In that chat box, I've already put how you can contact uh, Jen King's organization, both if you want more information about it and how to advocate along with her, and also if you, your family, or anyone you know need some of the services. So please see there's a website and, a, and a, an 800 number for your use there. So a little bit about us. Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition is a nonpartisan coalition of individuals and organizations that envision a socially just and respectful society. We were founded in 2008 and designated as a nonprofit in 2015 to educate and advocate, advocate for gender equity and economic security for all. And we are thrilled to call more than 300 individuals and more than 50 organizations um, partners, <clears throat> excuse me, by working together we can speak with one voice and make that voice more powerful as we work for systemic change to bring about that gender equity and economic security for all. So a few notes on today's conversation. It is being recorded. Give us a few days. We'll get back to you with the recording itself. You can always go as well to our website, which is bcwacbicwack.org. And uh, you'll see more information there. You'll also see a blog that Jen King has written to give you some additional background on the subject. And you can always go and search for any topic related to these areas, and there's tons of information for you. You can also follow us on our Facebook page. The link's on the website's homepage. Please like us and share the post. It's important that we can share this information out. So we're considering all of you a hub and we'd like you all to push out as a spokes to all of your uh, connections so that we can better advocate for these causes. Today's program, like other educational programs we offer here at the coalition is free. And while we operate efficiently, there are some costs, as you can imagine, if you feel that this program and the work of the coalition in general is of value to you, please consider making a financial contribution. We can do so through our website or by mailing a check <laughs> to us. And all that information is on the website, again, bcwac.org. So now let me get <laughs> to Jen King. As I mentioned, Jen is the Executive Director of the Council of Southeast PA and PROACT, Pennsylvania Recovery Organization Achieving Community Together. She has three decades of experience in development and leadership in nonprofit sector in Pennsylvania and in California. She has a Master's of Communication from LaSalle University and earned the Certified Fundraising Executive Credential. She serves as the board vice president of the Bucksmont Collaborative and chairs the membership committee. Jen will brief us on advocacy work around substance abuse disorder and recovery, which have faced unique challenges during the COVID pandemic. Welcome, Jen. Thanks, Maria. It's so nice to be here today. So All right. Start with you. You told us that one of the things was um, a lot of people don't understand that there's a lot of resources out there because they don't know how to access them. So why don't you start there? What do people need to know about what's available and how you get what you need? Absolutely. So when I started to think about our conversation today, um, a conversation that I had, a talk um, 
in preparing for that, I thought about a conversation I had a few Sunday nights ago with, with a colleague, Helen. So Helen's a volunteer for our organization. She has um, definitely been part of our own advocacy leadership program. She's deeply involved in helping us um, run our programs as a volunteer. But earlier in her life, she was someone who was looking for answers and resources for her family. So she first came to our Southern Bucks Recovery Community Center in Bristol, but because it was a meeting there about Narcan, the overdose re um, reversal medication that at the time was, you know, first on the scene and, and starting to be more widely shared. This was several years ago. So she was at the center where there's lots and lots of resources for families looking for support as their individual loved ones or themselves are looking for help as they um, seek, seek long-term recovery. But she didn't know anything about that. She knew she was at a meeting for Narcan. And so in her own family's journey, she realized, my goodness, as so she, it piqued her interest and she started to get a little more involved. She came to a meeting, she came to a program and you know, that started that journey that now has led to where she's deeply involved in giving back and in supporting. But it strikes her often that if she had known the resources that were available a little bit early in her family's journey, maybe that time of kind of stress and, and uncertainty and powerlessness that can often come with when a loved one's facing substance use disorder, maybe it could be shortened. And it struck me just how often I hear that story, that when families are facing um, really the challenges of this disease, you know, um, substance use disorder is a disease of isolation and it's a disease of, of pulling away from the people that might love you and wanna support you. And so we know that recovery is about connection and that we can start to build those bridges. And recovery support services is kind of the idea of what I landed on, what I wanted to share with you today, because many people might know um, about the resources that involve treatment or inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment, and then don't have any idea about recovery support services. So that I thought could be something I would share with you today. We're, we're so fortunate in our county that our county understands uh, the disease of substance use disorder in a way that nationally, maybe not every local leadership does, but we, ha we, can, we can build on that. Our county commissioners, um, the, our Bucks County Drug and Alcohol Commission, they, they really get the whole continuum of care that, that can be brought to bear on this and so but but awareness still remains a, a challenge so um i wanted to just share that with you all today so that it's there in everyone's toolbox when you're walking with a friend and in the morning and the, the friend starts to really confide for the first time about what her family is facing and you know they're they're really worried about a loved one's substance use but they don't know what to do well recovery supports can help them or their son or daughter is coming out of inpatient and they're gonna re-enter the world and, and try to rebuild their lives. Recovery supports can help them. They really can be um, a bridge and a, and a support to people at any point in, in the continuum of, of substance use disorder to recovery and really work to meet people where they are. So you're talking about the uh, services, you mentioned the center in Bristol, where else can people access them physically? Where are you? We, so, okay, so our, our main offices are here in Doylestown uh, and we have, we are, the council has pre prevention, treatment and, and recovery support services as three distinct lines. We do serve four counties. So we're Bucks County, Montgomery County, Chester County and Philadelphia County. And we have recovery community centers in, in three of those counties in Bucks, and Philadelphia and Montgomery County. And then we have um, mobile CRS services in Chester. So I'm gonna describe what CRS services are. So certified recovery specialists are individuals with lived experience of substance use disorder and, and a long-term recovery achievement. So they've been through the experiences that the people that they're working with have had. They share that lived experience in a way that really creates a chance for connection that's unlike any other. Often we, we learn and hear that CRS can kind of connect with someone in an in a early stage of change when really maybe nothing else is getting through. The, the advice they're getting, the um, pleas they're getting from the people in their lives, 
there might be walls up about that, that a CRS who says, I've been where you are. I know what you're going through. How can I help you in your recovery? What are your goals? There's, a, there's just a, um, an identification and a, and a kind of a dropping of the defensiveness that, that you're, you know what I'm co- going through in a way that, so the pow- that's the power of peer engagement and our certified recovery specialists uh, have gone and sought additional treatment. I mean, I'm sorry, additional education and certification. And they, they've made their life's work, the work of reaching back, reach, holding out a hand saying, I can help you in your recovery and I can support you. So um, we are, we have CRS who work out of our center. So, and then the center also builds a, a whole set of programs around recovery. We have CRS who are mobile, who will meet someone where they are, will go to someone's home or go to someone's doctor's appointment with them, can really engage with them um, as they as they look to build their toolbox of recovery uh, and, and work towards their individual goals. And then we also, um, the commission and Philadelphia support us in as one of the providers for the warm handoff, which means our CRS, our staff are embedded in the hospital systems in the emergency departments and the medical floors, so they can, if someone is, has survived an overdose or is diagnosed with, with SUD while in their hospital stay, our CRS can engage with them there. Um, often that's another window of opportunity for change and, and the power of a CRS saying, can I, can I sit with you? Can I talk with you? Can I help you? Um, can sometimes be one of the bridges to a path to recovery that, that is really, really powerful. So you're talking about having people who've been through there, been specially trained, be there as a person who can help the people who are going through it. I was also intrigued when I saw that you also train people who are family members so that they can reach out in a similar way to the family members. So can you talk a little bit about that? And also just overall, how many people are you touching with this? How many people are being treated? How many family members? You know, was there a, is there a number we should be aware of? Is that growing? Sure, absolutely. So the first part of the question, yes, the fa- we know that this um, is a family disease. It really impacts family systems. Um, I don't think you can have to go far to think about a family that you know that's been impacted. I know, you know, I don't have to go far. And I was, I, I you know, I know the experience of being someone who was working for a, an organization with exactly this mission. And when it was time for me to ask for help, I wasn't sure. I didn't know how to say it. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to talk about the truth of what my family was facing. You know, so even when you have the skill sets, there can be a barrier. And so out of the recovery support services, that need to engage families was, was just clear and constant. And from that, the same concepts around peers and lived experience work for families too. So the Certified Family Recovery Specialist, the CFRS, seeks to get that same education, that same set of toolboxes to say, I know what it's like to be in a family that's impacted by substance use disorder. I'm I'm here to help. What can I do? Another resource that we have here in Bucks County is the commission um, has a volunteer group of Family Connect. uh, And those are families who've said, We've been here, we are willing to help and you can have our number at any time. So in the hospital mm-hmm. systems, um, in the, as they, they work with someone, that's something that these volunteers have said, we'll be available. We have a team of people and we'll be available to take call. So because uh-huh. that, that power of telling the truth of what your family's facing, what we know is the earlier that you do that, the more opportunities for change come. Um, and so there's, there's a power that, so one of the things I, one of the stories I wanted to share with you today is um, in September of 2020, um, we were trying to figure out how to celebrate recovery month without our signature event. We typically have a recovery walk that's 25,000 strong in Philadelphia and people of all walks of life saying, this is what recovery looks like. And so in September of 2020, like everybody else, we were trying to figure out how to, you know, meet those same goals hit those emotional um, powerhouse messaging without being able to gather safely. So we had a series of Wednesday night conversations we called Proact Virtual Villages. And one of them, I was really privileged. I got to talk to Congresswoman Madeline Dean, and she was just about to have her book under our roof, was just about to be um, published. 
And so Madeline Dean's book is about her and her son, Harry Kunane, and their journey through his addiction and recovery. Um, and so they really, they kind of wrote it from both perspectives. So uh, Congresswoman Dean's perspective is that of a parent, of a, of, a, of a family member. And I was really struck as I talked with her. And because in their, you know, in their book, they talk about that experience of the period of time where he was really, really, really struggling with all the impacts of his substance use. Um, but he had hidden it so well. And he, you know, it was such a secret that they did not know what they knew the pressures and the challenges they were facing, but they didn't know the truth of it. So for years, you know, he was able to do that. And that's all, so often the truth. And they both acknowledge now that had, you know, he, part of what he, why he was able to do that, he acknowledges his privilege. You know, he might have had was spared some consequences that other people might not have been spared. He might might have, you know, but he but he recognizes that if he was able to tell the truth about what he was facing, or they had been able to uncover it, you know, act on their suspicions, figure it out earlier, that maybe the window of time where he was living with the impact of a substance use disorder, but before he had sought help could have been narrowed and could have been windowed, windowed down. And I was struck by that. And then I was also struck, you know, speaking of, of us as advocates, I was struck by the choice that, the, that their family made, that, that Congresswoman Dean, who's probably going to run again, probably face all the pressures of a campaign, chose to tell their family story now. It would have been very easy to understand, you know, it would have been easy to understand her choosing to do it after, you know, my public service is done and now I'll go and write this book with my son and we'll, we'll, we'll do that work. But no, she chose to do it now while she's in the middle of that, while she's kind of something, you know, stigma is, we, we've come really, really far in reducing the stigma of this disease, but we haven't eradicated it. So for them to be as, as straightforward of, with, with what their family faced kind of on a, on a, national scene says the power of what we see all the time when family members say this is what I've been through the power of our stories where someone can connect and say oh I've been there too or oh that really sounds like what my family is facing maybe I'll reach out for help um and so that struck me uh well and so the the, the other question you asked is about numbers um, so we serve about 3,000 people in Philadelphia, in Bucks County, and I'm sorry, I did not prepare the number of our, our families and, and recovery supports, but, but we also, I mean, anecdotally, we know that this, you know, substance use disorder impacts almost every community, every family, every neighborhood at some point. Someone you know has faced this. Um, you know, I think about the Independence Booth Cross campaign, someone you know, that really it's just, so the more people that know about recovery supports, because they really, it really is a low barrier uh, entryway for help. So someone who might not be ready to say, yes, I'm ready to talk about inpatient treatment, or I'm, uh, I'm ready to talk about outpatient treatment, might say yes to someone calling and saying, can I talk to you today and tell you about my experience? Might be willing to come to a recovery community center and just go to a class. Um, and then that person can engage with a certified recovery specialist or a certified family recovery specialist who could stay with them throughout the continuum. So you can be working on a goal early on of, you know, my substance use disorder is really getting in the way. I think I need help. And that might be the goal. And the goal might be accessing treatment. Um, or after treatment, it might be, I need a safe place to live. A CRS can work with you as you think about that and, and kind of work for that goal. You can build on that and, and, and want to get employment or want to kind of address some of the legal challenges of, of what happened in your, in your experience. The CRS can kind of walk with you as you face all of those things um, in a way that, that really creates uh, a sense of community and safety. So you mentioned that we're in a pretty good space in Bucks County because we have a lot of resources and a lot of support and politically, um, the political organizations also support the cause. Tell me about PROACT, because that's the advocacy arm, right? It's grassroots. So those of us who may not be at this moment touched by it or have gone to a different stage of that, everybody can be involved with this, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. PROACT, so we are, so the Council of South PA is our, is the nonprofit that provides all three arms of those uh, services I talked about. We do prevention. We are the um, student assistance provider in Bucks County schools. So working with children, youth, doing prevention education. 
Um, we do we do provide treatment and we work with people as they try to address the challenges perhaps of a of a DUI charge, things like that. So we have a, an intervention wing. And then our recovery supports wing is under our PROACT um, moniker and, and, and that uh, entity. And then as part of our work, we also have an advocacy leadership program. So many times someone's recovery journey um, might involve a season of gratitude for what they've been able to accomplish, gratitude for those who helped them along the way and a desire to give back. And advocacy is a great way to do that. And our advocacy leadership program, several of the stories of some of the key volunteers I know are about kind of finding ways to um, orient that part of their lives in a really positive, proactive way. So, so um, the centers are engaged in advocacy. We're part of, of communicating about the, um, you know, the, the stigma busting and the encouragement of leg legislators to keep these kinds of strategies and, and, um, and approaches in mind as they think about how we fund. So I can, one of the things um, we'll be asking people to help with is, you know, we've come a long way. The council has been part of this work probably since its inception, thinking about recovery supports as a field and as a professional development, thinking about being a CRS as a professional role. Um, the council's played a, a, a key role over the past 20 years of, of work that happened nationally around that. Um, it kind of parallel to people with mental, Ill, mental health challenges, working as um, in Pennsylvania, they're certified peer specialists. So then the certified recovery specialists are the, the um, substance use side of that same work. Um, it's, it's really powerful initiatives that we can't let up the, the kind of the, the, that forward motion. And so right now we were delighted um, when uh, the 2022 federal budget was passed, or I'm sorry, was not passed, but when, when it was developed, <laughs> we, when it was developed, because in the um, substance use disorder block grant, there was for the first time ever, funding set aside for specifically for recovery support. So identifying that kind of aspect of the continuum of care as something that should be funded and is integral to the, to the, to the toolbox. Um, so I, we, we, that, that is huge and, and really the result of thousands of people working so many hours to, to, to make that uh, a reality. However, they have not yet passed that budget. It's sitting, we're sitting in continu continuing resolutions. So we want people to certainly think about recovery supports as part of the, um, the approach that we do. Uh, that we want equitable funding for all mental health and drug and alcohol. Um, you know, we, we, years ago we passed the, the um, parity, mental health pa parity bill, but that, that doesn't mean that it's always equitable funding, that the ability to um, access funding for the services you need. Here, as I said, in Bucks County, we're very fortunate. Nationally, that might not always be the case. So, um, Jen, explain to me exactly what the mental health parity bill is. I mean, I'm sounding like, I hate to say this, but like school funding at a Pennsylvania level, right? We all know that it's supposed to be fair, but, you know. Yes. And, it, and so it's not. <laughs> right, right. And that's it. And so, you know, historically, the funding was kind of, uh, in Pennsylvania, there was a carve out for behavioral health services. And what that meant is it kind of developed differently than physical health um, reimbursements. So, okay. So their legislative advocacy meant that we did address that as a, as a state of legislation. And we said, no, these need to be equitable and parity means it needs to be the same. But the reality is that that long history and um, the entities that get built up around funding mean that it's not quite, you know, the, the, the end result is not yet quite what, what the goal would be. So we want to keep that in mind. We want to keep making sure that people have access to um, to the care that they need when they need it. Okay. I do want to remind everybody, if you have a specific question, please go ahead and put it in chat. Otherwise, I did want to ask you, Jenny, you've been doing this for what, 30 years now? A long time. Can you put this into context? Where are things now compared to where they were? Where do you want them to be? And what can each of us do to help you get to that next point? Uh, that's a really good, really good question. So interestingly, what my personal, you know, when people talk about their why, my personal story about my why um, 
leans a little more on the mental health side, but I'm a person whose grandmother was treated at Byberry Hospital for, for severe, serious mental illness. And she was treated there in the time when Life Magazine had a cover photo that showed the inhumane conditions that we, you know, that we were doing for people with, with mental illness. And so that was my mother's experience as a child. You know, she, she had her, knew her mother was there and, and no one talked to my mother about what mental illness was. No, there was no family supports when you were, there was no NAMI, there was nothing as she, when she was a child. So her childhood was very traumatic. And as a result of that, you know, some of the things that happened in her life, the, the resources. And so now I know, and, and my life's work has been working in places where if that were to happen in a family, the care is compassionate. It is um, evidence-based. It is person-centered and state trauma-informed. You know, we might not be perfect all the time, but those are pretty fair as, like assumptions we can make about the care that you would get if you have serious mental illness or a substance use disorder. But that's in my lifetime. In my lifetime, we went from conditions that were horrific to where we are today. And so I've, you know, and I think that same thing is true for drug and alcohol. You know, this organization was founded at a time when it was called the council because maybe you don't want to be super explicit about exactly what you're doing. Mm. You know, the, the work that people did in their own recovery was kind of shrouded in anonymity. That was a key value. And now the work we do says, you know, of course, if you want an anonymity, we were going to respect that and we're going to, we're going to follow all the privacy, but telling your story has real power too. And if you want to tell your story, someone else might, might benefit from that and learn. And so many, many people, you know, Congresswomen, uh, celebrities, many, many people now talk about what they're facing, tell the truth of their experience. Um, so that work of stigma, I think the work that we have to do going forward is, is like I described that the steps and strategies and access that would shorten the period of, of struggle, that would shorten the period of, I don't know where to turn. Um, many times families who, you know, who have been kind of through that, that path to recovery will talk about the period and that they talk about it as a season of darkness when they didn't know. And so the more people that know and can help, um, connect people, the more, because families, you know, that we used to operate under the assumption that people needed to hit rock bottom. We don't operate on that assumption anymore. We know that help can be accessed at any point and that a family can get help and resources before maybe their loved one is ready. But, and that that progress can be there, that maybe their work is, let me do the work of our family structure. Let me do the work of, of my own so that I can best support my, my person when they're ready or, or in their own journey. And I'll be stronger no matter what because of it. So I think the, that's the work that we have in the future um, is to widen access, make it you know, more universally access, uh, accessible, uh, affordability and, and awareness. Now you had said some of these uh, services are free. Mm -hmm. They are, yeah. So, so yeah. We have support from, as I said, the Drug and Alcohol Commission, our county commissioners are um, very, very supportive of this work. So in, in the counties, the, we, the counties also have support from the Pennsylvania Department of, of Drug and Alcohol Programs. So Secretary Smith, Secretary Jen Smith at, uh, runs that organization for Pennsylvania. And again, forward thinking, um, really progressively thoughtful about access and funding these things. And then federally, um, it's through the, the um, SAMHSA department. So the SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. But so there's funding available there. Um, and so many times people are able to access those services if they can't afford um, them on their own. Those kind of that stream of federal, state and county funding mm -hmm. makes these services available. Um, others can access them through private insurance. Our programs are free to, free to individuals because of those those experiences right. and also grant funding. Which again, gets back to the budget and why once it's passed, you love that there's some recovery money in there for the first time ever, but is there anything we can do to speed that along or do anything along those lines? So what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, we need to talk to everybody. Anytime we hear anybody struggling in any way or identifying that this could be a problem at any point to let them know that, hey, if you're just even trying to figure out what's going on, you can enter now and get some services for you. 
And then you figure out. So I hear that it's that PR kind of, you know, reaching out to each other, but also is there a a legislative avenue you want as well? Yeah, I think think, um, we do. So our advocacy leadership program creates an annual um, voter's guide. Uh, It's called Recovery Voices Count. And we follow faces and voices kind of uh, initiated this work of envisioning the recovery community those living with those with lived experience, envisioning them as a constituency of confidence, consequence. So, you know, those voices matter. Informing. So every year we we uh, have volunteers who spend ordinate an inordinate amount of hours asking legislators who will be on the ballot that year about key issues around substance use disorder. Um, to how do they understand it? Do you know there are still people who might run for office who really don't understand it as uh, from the construct of a disease, who might think it is, um, you know, who just aren't informed about it. So that's important that we know that our, our legislative leaders understand this. Um, so that's one component is certainly getting more involved in that. The other ways to get involved if, if people want to learn more or, or give back or be part of it. That, so certainly for us, we have the recovery walks, which no event like that, we're hoping in person in 2022, but no event like that happens without lots of volunteers. So there's chances to volunteers, to volunteer for our events or at our centers. Certainly there, those are opportunities. The other piece that people could do is learn about Narcan if they don't already know the commission, um, our centers, we are, we are all part of getting those um, overdose uh, re- reversal treatment opportunities out to people because you just never know. And, and if, if we can save that life and, and create the opportunity for someone to seek recovery later, we want every opportunity to do that. So the more people that are trained in, in administrating Narcan and, and have that with them, it's kind of a, 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 like a, a safe embrace of our community and those who might be at risk. So that's the other thing that almost everybody can do is, you know, we think about um, medications in our homes and prescription drugs in our homes. And you can become a, a stronger advocate of, of the prescription of those. So, when, you know, I know from my experience, I went to a dentist and I was having work done and, and you know, the advice was here, you're gonna need these. And I said, well, hold on, I might not need them. And also maybe, ask, you know, they didn't know what I did for a living. So maybe ask me what my history is and, and whether I want opioids as, as part of my pain medicine or, you know, so we can be advocates about that at the same time, we can be part of, Bucks County has um, prided itself on leading in a uh, prescription drug take back day. So every year in October, we have lots and lots of volunteers across the county who are ready and willing and able to take those expired prescription drugs, take um, sharks this year we did, and, and, uh, and, and then we gave out Narcan. Uh, the commission led that effort as well. And, and uh, uh, District Attorney Matt Weintraub is competitive about it, and and we collect the most amount of pounds of, of those. So those are the kinds of Good. things that we, it's it's and and the other piece is have the conversations, have the prevention conversations with your children. Think of you know this doesn't need to be taboo. Talk about it earlier than you think. Talk about you know if you see a a, a storyline on TV, talk about the risks that might be happening. Make this part of your family's approach that you want to be informed. You want to understand the role that you know alcohol does play in our community but also understand the risks that that come with that 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 kind of normalize a community approach to care and prevention and i love that you've you know you keep it broad when you just mentioned alcohol i think a lot of times people are thinking substance abuse or thinking of you know the quote unquote drug addict type of thing um but you know that any substance that is abused could be uh, problematic. There are two questions I just want to bring up that were put in their chat to make sure that, uh, and again, I invite anyone to, to add their own. So if you would, Jen, are the support services that you mentioned in ho- for hospital patients also available for, pa- excuse me, for persons who only receive care in the emergency room? Yes. Yes. So there's, Bucks County actually has a couple initiatives. So we are part of the warm handoff and our staff are, are in the emergency departments. Um, our staff is at um, St. Mary Medical Center and Jefferson Bucks, but other providers are part of the other hospitals in Bucks County as well. So there should be a CRS affiliated with each emergency department. And initially, you know, the when a program pilots and launches, 
because it was, you know, pretty narrowly focused. So in the emergency department for people with uh, over who are surviving overdose. And as you do it, you realize, oh, wait, there are also people on the med surge floor who were admitted because of a medical reason, but really the medical reason is related to their substance use disorder or, you know, or um, someone presents from an accident, but the accident also involves substance use. So we brought, you know, and, and the funders and the county and the commission helped us, you know, listen to that advocacy. And so it's a much broader program now. And then also the work has broadened in that the county has CRS embedded with police and with EMS. Oh. And so they're responding in the community as well. There's the B crew program and I'm not getting Mallory's on the call. I'm not going to remember what the Falls Township program is called, but you know, so the, so we're really realizing that that power of peer that we have, that we've identified as so valuable can be part of our whole community response. So the more of that that we can do, I think the better when, when a police officer is, is responding and the person is actually living with and experiencing a substance use disorder issue as opposed to, uh, oh, there you go, Mallory, put it in the chat. Thanks, Mallory. Yep. Um, yep. You know, so, so it's, it's just, it's kind of the aha common sense reaction. Like, of course, someone who has expertise in this should be there with them. So to, you know, to our county's credit, the creativity with which they are approaching this is really, really commendable. Before we get to the last question, I do want to just, you mentioned about the chat. There is good information in there about support. Um, excuse me. There's messages. It, <laughs> got to get my things right. There's some good links in there so that you can, um, the next medication take back day, for example, the set. Um, Saturday, April 30th, and that's information's there. There's links, there's other information to the um, organizations and the combined or the services that you were referring to. So I would invite you all to take a good look at that. And then just to wrap up with our final question, which is what funding have you received from PA for mental health um, services and outreach? So what have been funding have we received for mental health? That was the question. Okay, so the, the council- From the state. Yeah, 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 yeah. But ours is going to be drug and alcohol because mental health is a different set of, of services and that's not our bailiwick. That's not what we do. But certainly um, we've received funding from the um, our Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, the DDEP funding comes through and the, the, the kind of, I'm, I'm talking inside baseball here, but the, commit, the Bucks County Drug and Alcohol Commission is one example. Every county has what's called a single county authority. So here in, in Bucks County is the commission, in Montgomery County is the Office of Drug and Alcohol Services and so on. And so DDAP money typically comes funneled through those SBAs and then they work with local providers to do so. DDAP also makes grants directly. Um, we don't currently have a DDAP grant directly, but that's another avenue for state funding. And then, and then of course, there's the... Um, the, the um, this is again going to be inside baseball, but Magellan Health here in Bucks County is the medical care organization, so the managed care organization. Sorry, so that the um, for those for whom they're eligible for Magellan Care, that's kind of their insurance and and supports them, and that's you know kind of a, a different funding stream. But those are kind of the the what what we know uh, for recovery supports. What we think is probably likely for long term sustainability is kind of a three tiered stool where what, you know, that county and that county funding that, that comes from state funding is key and important program funding, grant funding is key and then community philanthropy. So our recovery walks is a fundraiser. I know that, that, you know, community donors and supporters make this work possible that probably it's always gonna need to be blended because um, just the nature of the work and the, the opportunity to move forward that, that those all three components are gonna be key. So I hear from you is there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of funding sources out there for those, although they can always be improved. And there are many, many different specific things we can do within our own families, our own neighborhoods, and with the organizations that you're affiliated with to make a difference. So I, 45 minutes goes quite quickly. So I need to wrap up, but um, before I do so, I do want to, Remind everyone, take a look at chat, copy, copy that out for your own services, because when I, when I cancel this, all that chat information will go. 
Um, so I just want to end with some gratitude. I want to thank the board of directors for the women's Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition and to the issue specialists who volunteer their time with us. I want to especially thank all of you for joining us for keeping it brief and remind you that we will be back on March 2nd with Jackie Rogers, who will be talking about living wage, what that is and how we can help bring that about for our state. And I want to give a very special thank you to Jen King, who, um, of course, again, of the Council for Southeast PA and PROACT, who shared so much information with us in such an accessible manner that I really appreciate all of your work. Again, I refer you back to her blog in at um, bcwac.org, our website, because you can sit down and settle with it and look and, uh, read that and absorb it some more. And then there's also the information to contact her and the organization should you need it or should you just like some more information. So with that, I wanna thank you all again and I hope we'll see you back here on March 2nd for a living wage. Thank you so much. Thanks Maria, what a privilege. Bye-bye. Yeah.